been an imposter for the last four weeks. We've been enjoying this series so far. You guys been enjoying it? Yeah. It's been a pretty good series. Um, the first week, Ricky came up here, and he talked about how uh, in our prayer life, we tend to be Christian imposters. We tend to be people who, who say we believe in one thing, but our, our character and our actions actually reflect another thing. And so he came and talked about our prayer life. And then uh, Tim came up the week after that and talked about money. He talked about how money can apply to us right now and how it can apply to us in the future. So that was a good message. Uh, Robbie came up last week and talked about how our lives as Christians should demand explanation from the rest of the world. That was a good week, too. And, uh, and small groups have been really good. Everything's been pretty good. This has been a pretty uh, hard-hitting hard hitting series for a lot of people, so uh, it's just been a really good time. Tonight, we are starting week four. This is our second to last week of the series. Everybody say, aww. 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 That's so sad. Uh, but tonight's message is called Change You Can Believe In. Um, and let me go ahead and say this right up front because I know you'll be distracted. Tonight we're not talking about any type of political leader, so um, just not going to say names, but tonight we're not talking about that. The reason that we call this message Change You Can Believe In is because tonight we're going to be talking about change. We're going to be talking about God's ability to change you and His ability to change certain things about your life. And we're going to be talking about how that is the only change that you can truly believe in. And so let me go ahead and give you a disclaimer real quick. Um, our church is in a campaign right now. And basically a campaign means that the, the adults are learning the same thing as the teenagers. And sometimes uh, the little kids, like elementary kids, are learning the same thing, but I guess not this time. Um, so the adults are learning the same thing as the teenagers. And so we've kind of been in the same material lately, big church and whatever we call this. This is not little church, medium-sized church? Um, and so something that always happens during a campaign is this. Um, Pastor Jeff will know that in youth service, the, uh, the people who speak tend to do a very good job and have very great messages. And so Pastor Jeff, um, you don't have to clap for that. Pastor Jeff looked at his crystal ball, right? So he was like, I know the youth is going to have a really good message next Sunday. So Pastor Jeff pulls out his crystal ball, and he looks into his crystal ball, and he says, wow, they're doing this message called Change You Can Believe In, about how some people believe in God but don't believe God can change them. I think I'll do that same message, too. And so Pastor Jeff completely stole this entire message from me, and he preached it last Sunday. So if you were here last Sunday, um, you probably heard a lot of this stuff, but he did, I did come up with it first. Um, not really, actually. This whole series is based on this book right here by the Christian Atheist. Who's read this book? Anybody? Yeah. 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 Ricky's read it like three times, and he's still saying um, four. It hasn't changed at all. Okay, um, so it's based on this book called The Christian Atheist. So we've been taking everything from that. It's still been really good. So I just have to throw that disclaimer out there. If you were here last Sunday, you probably heard a lot of this stuff. If not, then it's still going to be a fun message. So like I said, tonight is called Change You Can Believe In. Let me give you the background of this whole message right here. You might want to listen up or you, or you might not understand. We have a dilemma as Christians in today's society. In today's society, if we claim to believe in God, and you claim to believe in the same God that I believe in, you have to believe three things about God. And these aren't on your outline anywhere. I'm just going to kind of throw them out there. You have to believe three things about God. They're the three theological characteristics of God. The first one is God's omnipresence. Everyone say omnipresence. Omnipresence. That just means that God is everywhere at all times. So no matter where you are or who you are or what you're doing, God is right there. Omnipresence just means all present. So omnipresence is God's being everywhere at all times. So you have to believe in God's omnipresence. You have to believe in God's omniscience. Everyone say omniscience. 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 And basically, God's omniscience means that God is all-knowing. It means that no matter who you are, God knows about everything, past, present, future. God is all-knowing. But the last thing that you have to believe about God, and the thing that we're going to talk about tonight, is God's omnipotence. And that's kind of like omnipotence, but omnipotence. Everyone say omnipotence. Omnipotence. Omnipotence basically means God is all-powerful. That God can do anything, no matter what, no matter who you are, where you are, past, present, future, God can do anything. Anything. And some people are like, well, can God make a mountain too big that he can't move it? The answer is yes, he can, because God can do anything. And so God is om he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. And so the last thing we're going to talk about is God's omnipotence. And here's the deal with, with what we have as Christians today. We believe that God is omnipotent. And so our beliefs reflect that of someone who believes in God. Because we believe that God is omnipotent. We believe that he can do anything. And yet for some reason... When it comes to changing something about our own life, we tend to forget all about that. We tend to forget that, that God can actually do anything and that we can do anything through the power of Jesus. When it comes to changing something about ourselves, we just suddenly lose sight of God's omnipotence and suddenly our actions become that of an atheist. 
And so we start, we, we, we believe things that a Christian would believe, but our character reflects that of an atheist, and that is the definition of a Christian imposter. And so tonight we're going to be talking about how we can get to the point where we can believe in God's power to change us, and some steps that we can take to change. And so before we get started, I want to read to you the opening chapter um, of this book by Craig Rochelle. Or not this book, but this, this chapter. That fell. This chapter is called, When You Believe in God But Don't Think You Can Change. So here we go. This is just the way I am, I confidently told my counselor. I can't change. At the tender age of 26, I was a candidate to become fully ordained. Several leaders who were overseeing my journey towards ordination were convinced that I was a workaholic and they needed to help me change. I was convinced they were wrong. They just don't know how much I care about God and His church, I rationalized. This wise and caring panel of ministers asked me to take a week off to contemplate, to contemplate my priorities and consider what changes I could make that would give me the endurance to go the distance. Knowing this was a battle I wouldn't win, I agreed to take some time off, although I honestly never planned to follow through and slow my frenzied pace. When they inevitably discovered that I didn't take the week off, but instead continued working feverishly, they assigned me to mandatory counseling to address my workaholic tendencies. I found myself sitting quietly in a little chair, facing a well-intentioned counselor. He reviewed his notes, mumbled a little to himself, looked up at me, and said, You really don't think you can change, huh? Convinced that this was just the way I was, I explained, again, how I couldn't lessen my drive to work. I'll never forget what happened next. He leaned in, and lovingly, not much above a whisper, said, So, what you're telling me is, even our God isn't big enough to help you change? He got me. And hopefully he got some of you tonight too, because when I read that, he got me. Because um, there's been situations in my life where I just didn't think that I could ever change the way that I was. Uh, a couple months ago, probably five or six months ago, it became obvious to me that I had a hard time relating to other people's emotions. So like when people were feeling sad or angry or upset or whatever, I just had a hard time relating to that, and so I couldn't help them. And so one day I decided I'm just going to pray, you know, God, please teach me about something about emotions. And God did answer that prayer, and it was a long, grueling process, because God was like, hey, this is what it's like to be sad. Bam. And so I was like, oh, this sucks. Um, and so God did help me change. And so eventually it became evident to me that I could change through the power of Jesus. So if you look at your outline, you will see the statement, this is just the way I am. This is just the way I am. Who's ever said that before? Anybody ever said that before? Probably all of us have said that before. Because that statement it, it, is the epitome it's like the very essence of what it means to denounce God's omnipotence. To denounce the ability that God has to help you change. And so right underneath that, I want you to write, I don't believe in God's power to change me. I don't believe in God's power to change me. This is just the way I am equals, I don't believe in God's power to change me. And so I want to get that point across tonight. That when you think this is just the way that you are, and you think that you're never going to change, and you think that, that there's nothing that you can do to help yourself change some sort of issue about your life, whether it be sinful, a sinful situation or not, when you denounce God's ability to help you change, you do it by saying, this is just the way that I am. And so tonight we're going to take care of that issue. And maybe, maybe your issue tonight is that you really don't believe in God's power to help you change. Maybe you would say that, you're like, yeah, I'm like, I really don't believe that God can help me change. And you'd be willing to admit that. Well, if that's your problem, I would read to you Philippians 4.13 on our outline. It says, for I can do how many things through Christ? Everything. Everything. Through Christ, who gives me strength. Okay, so would you agree that changing yourself is something that you do? It falls under the category of everything. And so since this verse says you can do everything through Christ who gives you strength, you can change yourself through Christ. Who gives you strength? And so bottom line, problem solved right there. And so now that we understand that God really does have the ability to help us change, we can start diving into this process. The next, step, the next things on our outline is say three steps to changing. So we're going to dive right into that and go through these three steps real quick. Number one, step number one is this. Identify the problem. Identify the problem. Just like if you were in Alcoholics Anonymous, which hopefully none of us have ever been, Ricky, um, you have to identify the problem. Just kidding. Nobody started any kind of rumors. It was last week. Um, so, so you're sitting here and you write this down, and you're probably thinking, you're thinking to yourself, well, what is the problem that I need to change in my life? What are some things that I need to do 
Because I was thinking, eventually you just like, you know what, there's just not really anything about my life that I need to change. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I, you know, there's not really anything big, any big area of my life that I need to fix. And to you, I, I would say, I'm not going to say you have a problem, but I will say that you probably have a problem. And here's why. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. gone. A new life has begun. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And so I think that, that God makes us into new creations when we receive Jesus so that we can start to act like new creations. But the problem with most, most Christians today, most, that's not a word, most Christians today, is that they don't act like new creations. They accept Jesus into their heart and, and they, they, they feel like they're Christians, but they don't live their life acting like new creations. And so you ask yourself, how do I live like a new creation? Well, it tells you in the verse. It says the old life is gone, gone. A new life has begun. And so think about this for a second. If you made a list of, your, of the things that you did in your life before you met Jesus and the things you did in your life after you met Jesus, and you compare them side by side, how different would they be really? Like if you really looked at them, could you look at those two lists and say, wow, look at the things that were in my old life that aren't in my new life, and the things that I do in my new life that are good that weren't in my old life. Could you look at that list and truly say, wow, I am like a new creation. Jesus has made me new. And if the answer to that question is no, that's probably 100% of everybody in the whole world because no one's got it perfect. And so if the answer is no, I would say that you probably have a problem. There's probably something in your life on the old life list that you need to knock off the new life list. And that is the thing that you need to change. And so let me give you six questions real quick that you can ask yourself that will help you identify your problem. And actually, over to the right of this, I want you to write and others. So where it says on your outline, six questions that, to ask yourself, I want you to write and others. Because some of these questions you might have to ask others if, if you're genuinely interested in getting an honest opinion on this. So question number one says this. Do you arrange your schedule, priorities, or spending around it? Or maybe you need to ask yourself, what do I arrange my schedule, my priorities, and my spending around? Like all the money that I spend, and all the time that I invest, and all my priorities, whatever's on the top of my priority list, if that's something that's consuming all your schedule, all your priorities, and all your money, I would look more into that, because that might be your problem. Question number two says, are you denying it's a problem, or trying to keep it a secret? So maybe you have to ask yourself, what am I denying as a problem, or what in my life am I keeping a secret? And you might want to look more into that, because that might be your problem. Question number three, do you continue even though you are hurting people? Or maybe you need to ask yourself, what am I doing that's hurting people? Or maybe you need to actually go to someone, someone close to you, or maybe someone you might not even know, and say, listen, what do I do that's hurting you? Because whatever it is, I want to change it, because I want to be a better person through the power of Christ. Question number four, do your family and friends say you have a problem? These are the people that are closest to you. The people that are closest to you, that know you the best, do they say that you have a problem? And whatever they might say, that could very well be your problem. Question number five, and this is the ultimate test of whether or not this is a problem. Can you go a week without it? Maybe your problem is texting. Ooh, could you go a week without texting anybody? Like, she said, yes, I doubt it. Let's try it, I'm just kidding. Um, so whatever your problem is, maybe you need to ask yourself, what can I not go a week without? Like, what do I have to do on a weekly basis? And whatever that might be, you might want to look more into that. Question number six, is it driving others away? Is it pushing people out of your life? And maybe you need to go with people and say, what do I do that makes you not want to be around me? What do I do that's pushing you away? And you might want to look more into that, because that could be your problem. And so I would say this. I would say, whatever you answer one of these questions with, like if one area of your life applied to any of these six questions, I would look more into that area and try to figure out, is that the problem? Ask some people, pray about it, maybe really figure out, is this the thing that I need to take care of? And I would say, if you identify one thing with three or more of these questions, that's probably your problem. And if that's the case, then we need to take care of it tonight. Like, we don't need to wait like till next week. It needs to be taken care of tonight. And so hopefully you can get that in your mind that it's time to take care of it tonight. And so 
Once we've identified what the problem was, we can go on to step number two under one condition. Because there's actually a step in between step number one and step number two that I didn't write down because it seems just very basic. After you've identified the problem, you have to actually decide that you want to fix the problem. Because we can identify problems all we want. We can make lists and lists and lists and lists and lists of tons of problems that we've all got, and we can say, wow, that's a really bad problem. You know, the Bible says we shouldn't do this, and we shouldn't do this, and we can make all kinds of lists and say all kinds of bad things that we do and all this, and we can confess all we want. But until we really determine in our hearts and in our minds that we want to fix the problem no matter how hard it's going to be, then we can move on to step number two. Step number two is this, can the excuses. Can the excuses. And if that's too much of an idiom for you, you can just write, stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. And so I wrote this point, and I was thinking to myself, why do human beings make excuses? Like in the first place, like why do we ever even come up with excuses? And so I was thinking, and I was thinking, you know, as human beings, it's very natural to us to just quit. Like when things get hard in our lives, we just want to quit. When we're doing homework and it starts to get hard, we just want to stop. We just don't want to do it anymore. We just want to quit and just, just stop and put it away. Whatever it is in our lives that might get hard, we just want to quit. And so when things get hard and we quit, we have to have something there to make ourselves feel better about quitting. Because that, we all know that quitting is not good. We know that we should try to persevere through things and stuff like that. And so when we make excuses, what we're actually doing is rationalizing the fact that we we're making ourselves feel better for quitting on something. Because when things get hard, we start to make excuses as to why we can't do this, I'm never going to be good enough, both of my parents did this, all of We just start to make all these excuses, and the excuse monster pops up and grabs us and pulls away whatever desire that we had to ever fix the problem, and we just quit. We make all kinds of excuses to make ourselves feel better. Let me, let me tell you a story that came out of the Bible um, about a guy who came up with some excuses. And this is how naturally excuses come to people. Um, if you were here last Sunday, you already heard the story, but you can hear it again because it's a good story. In the, the country of Israel, there's this fountain. And at this fountain, the Bible says that there was this angel that came to this fountain every now and then. And this angel stirred up the fountain. And every time the angel stirred up the fountain, if there was a sick person who got in the fountain, like if they were the first sick person to get into the fountain, they would be healed instantly. Just healed. And so at this fountain, there were literally like hundreds of sick people just crowded around this fountain. Sick people, lepers, people who couldn't walk, people who just had like demon possessed, just all kinds of messed up people crowding around this fountain. Because when the angel came and started the fountain, you best get in that fountain as quickly as you can because you will be healed. And so Jesus comes up to this fountain one time in John chapter 5, and, uh, and he sees this guy. The Bible says this guy couldn't walk. Like, he was crippled. And the Bible says that he'd been crippled for 38 years. That's a long time. And so this is where we pick up the story. John chapter 5, verse 5, after Jesus sees this guy. It says, When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool, or the fountain, and knew how long he had been there, he said, Do you want to get well? Pause. That's such a basic question. Like, that is literally a yes or no question. All Jesus said to the guy was, do you want to get well? Like, these issues that you got, do you just, do you want to fix them at all? He didn't ask, why are you well? Like, what's wrong with you? He didn't ask, how long have you been here? What's going on in your life? He didn't try to have some kind of emotional conversation with him. He just went up to him and said, do you want to get well? But listen to what the guy says. The Bible says, the sick man said, sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in. I would classify that as an excuse. Of course, he couldn't get well, because that's true. He couldn't get in. But all Jesus asked him was, do you want to get well? And yet, for some reason, he just came up with the excuse as to why he couldn't get well. So we've got to can the excuses, because if we keep these excuses in our minds, we're never going to be able to move past the step number two. So how do we can the excuses? How do we get rid of the excuses in our life? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10b on our outline says this. It says, we capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So I want to teach you a little concept called controlling your thoughts. And it is probably the most important thing that I've ever learned how to do, controlling your thoughts. If you've ever taken term life, you probably saw the object lesson where they taught you that your thoughts are the most important thing in your life. 
It, it starts out with your thoughts, and they, they'll talk about how once you start thinking things over and over and over, they eventually become your actions. And once your actions start repeating themselves over and over and over, that eventually becomes your habits. And so once your habits start be happening over and over, that becomes your character. And once your character starts repeating itself over and over and over, that becomes your destiny. And it all started with your thoughts. And so your thoughts are going to determine every single aspect of your life. So when it comes down to it, whatever you think is going to determine what happens next in your life. Especially when it comes to the area of coming up with excuses. Because the excuses start in the mind. And if we can't learn to control those excuses that are popping into, their, into our head, and when those things pop into our head, if we can't learn to grab them and say, you know what, I'm not even going to let myself think that. If we can't do that, the excuses are just going to pile up and pile up, and they're going to weigh us down, and eventually we're just going to quit, and we're not going to feel bad for it because we've got this huge stack of excuses lined up here. And so when we control our thoughts, we have to be aware of when that thought is popping into our head. When that, when that first excuse is popping up, when that thing that says, I'm never going to be the way that I want to be, I'm never going to change this area of my life, I can't do this, this is just the way I am, we've got to grab that and say, you know what, I'm not even going to let myself think that. We've got to teach it to obey Christ. We have to teach it the truth. We have to teach it that the Bible says that we were created in God's image and that we have the mind of God and that God created us and God loves us and we are God's sons and daughters and he just wants to show us off. We have to replace those excuses and we have to replace those thoughts with the truth. And so we've got to identify the problem. We've got to establish that we actually want to fix the problem. And then the last thing that we've got to do, or we've got to can the excuses, and the last thing that we've got to do, step number three, as the creators of Nike put it, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Whatever it is. Maybe you've got no idea what it is. Take some time to think about it. Just think about the problem in your life. Maybe your problem is unforgiveness. Maybe you've got somebody in your life that you haven't forgiven for a certain issue that you've got going on. And maybe you just need to say, you know what? I've just got to forgive that person. But we've got to start with baby steps. So whatever it is, maybe it is start praying for that person. No matter how much bitterness you feel towards them, start praying for that person. And start saying, you know, maybe I need to start rebuilding that relationship with that person. Maybe I need to start doing nice things for that person. Maybe I need to read some books on forgiving people. Maybe I need to talk to somebody who's had these same issues. Whatever the issue might be, we have to figure out what our next step is going to be in that area. Let me show you something real quick. This is why we have to take that next step. And this is why we have to just do it, no matter what the cost. This is so technical. Oh well. This is my friend Jackson right here. Everyone say, hey Jackson. Hey Jackson. Hey. Me and Jackson go way back. I've known Jackson since I was like six, five, four, a long time. And so I want to tell you something about Jackson. A few years ago, Jackson did something very terrible to me. Um, this is all hypothetically speaking. He didn't actually. But a few years ago, Jackson did something terrible to me. He stole my girlfriend. Just straight up stole her. Like, in front of me. Like, I was there. And so he, he straight up stole my girlfriend, and I never forgave him for it. Like, like he does not deserve my forgiveness because he just he took my girlfriend. He should apologize to me, not me forgive him. <laughs> And so I go to church one night, and I say, you know what, that message really got to me about changing myself, and I decided the one thing that I need to do is just forgive Jackson. And so I take this rope, and I tie it around this chair. Just one more knot there. And so I take that rope, and I, and I tie it to this chair, and I say, you know what, I'm going to forgive Jackson. This is the next thing that I have to do. And I see Jesus down there, and Jesus is like, James, when you forgive Jackson, we're going to be so much closer. Like, you're going to be able to go so much closer to me once you forgive Jackson. And so I say, okay, Jesus, I'm coming for you. And I start to go, and I start to go, and suddenly that rope tugs. And I say, oh yeah, i got to forgive Jackson. And so I'm standing there, and I'm like, i got to forgive Jackson, i got to forgive Jackson. I say, well, what if I just serve in the church some more? And so I come over here, I start serving in the church some more, and, and I'm like, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to come for you. And so I come for Jesus, and suddenly that road tugs. And Jesus is like, you've got to forgive Jackson until you can get any closer to me, because that's the thing that I'm telling you to do. And I'm like, okay, I've got to forgive Jackson. And I'm like, well, what if, I, what if I read this book? What if I do this stuff over here? What if I join this program? What if I start serving here? What if I start doing this? What if I start doing a million other things other than forgiving Jackson, let me ask you this. Based on pure logic, am I ever going to get where I want to be if I hold on to this rope? No. I 
can do a million other things that seem like the right thing to do, but until I take the next step that Jesus is telling me to take, I am never going to get where I need to be in my relationship with Jesus. Thanks, Jackson, for doing that mean thing to me. Just kidding. So So we've got to take the next step. Whatever it is, we've just got to do it. We've got to think in our minds, I'm going to abandon whatever the cost might be. I'm going, to, I'm going to abandon what people are going to think about me. I'm going to abandon whatever the church is going to think about me or whatever the consequences are going to be or whatever, whatever pride I'm going to have to release. I'm just going to abandon every bit of it and say, I don't care. I'm just going to do it. Because God will wait on you. No matter how long it takes, God will wait 10, 20, 30 years. God will wait on you because it's your next step that you have to do through the power of Jesus Christ. But there is good news tonight. And it's the last point on our outline. The good news tonight is this. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. God still wants to do amazing things in your life. And if we take that next step and we take whatever the problem is and we take whatever steps we need to take, if we just do whatever we need to just do, and we move on from this step, and we move on from, from this, these issues in our past, and we let go of that road, and we get close to Jesus in the way that he asked us to get close to him, we are not done. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, if you've been in this church since it started, or if this is your first time here tonight, if you're not dead, you are not done. God still wants to do amazing and incredible things in your heart and in your life. And so it's not usually what's going to happen. The band's going to play like they do every night. And if I can have the prayer partners go ahead and come on down, whatever that might be. Um, whatever that next step in your life is, whatever problem you identify tonight, if it's, if it's some sort of addiction, I really encourage you to come pray with these people because we will hook you up with some accountability. And that will really, really help you. And, uh, but just because you pray with these people doesn't mean you have an addiction. So no one's going to be looking at you like, oh my God, I have an addiction. So it's all things like that. Um, and maybe you don't need to pray with these people. Maybe you really feel like you just need to pray by yourself and ask Jesus what the problem is. Ask Jesus what you can do. But at some point, we've got to take the next steps. At some point, we've just got to do it. We've got to stop praying about it. We've got to stop asking God about it. What do I do? What do I do? And all along, God is saying, just do it. So when the band plays, would you guys come on out? Thank you.